friends and family. We want to preach from the subject, I can see clearly now. I can see clearly now. Won't you do me a favor and help me preach this? Won't you turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, neighbor, I can see clearly now. Now, the way you said it, your neighbor isn't sure they believe you. So won't you go ahead and clear your throat if you've got some congestion in your throat like I do this morning. Won't you go ahead and clear that out and get your best uh, Sunday morning in the month of October voice on and tell your neighbor like you believe in neighbor. I can see clearly. Friends and family, uh, sisters and brothers, um, since the beginning of history, people have tried uh, to figure out, to create and set uh, and uphold rules um, that define what is required for people to belong to certain groups. Um, whether it is uh, national affiliation or tribal affiliation, whether it is cultural affiliation, whether it is uh, belonging to uh, religious groups or other uh, institutions uh, that have been created, uh, people have tried to figure out exactly uh, what is required um, in order for an individual to belong. Um, and I want to use uh, two groups, the, the two groups, uh, as we think about this, uh, my brothers and sisters. Um, one is uh, to think about what it, uh, the way people have thought about what it means to be Christian. Um, and we see uh, uh, raging over uh, the centuries and over the millennia uh, debates about what is required in order to be a Christian. What do people have to believe? Uh, now, there is a certain line of thought that has become popular in America, particularly in white evangelical Christianity and all of the outshoots uh, thereof uh, that uh, lay out a certain uh, doctrinal belief or commitment uh, to believe in uh, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, the uh, physical death and resurrection uh, of Christ and uh, the second coming. Uh, but these have not always been uh, required or a part of what it means to be Christian. That for centuries, these were debated um, as people wrestled with what is essential, what is, what are the basics that are required for people to believe. Um, uh, these, my brothers and sisters, are very recently, it's only been really since uh, uh, the 1920s, um, and really uh, it caught a hold in the 1970s that these began to be uh, 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 essential beliefs uh, for Christian uh, worship here in the United States. Uh, but over the multiple centuries, uh, these debates have, uh, in, have been uh, engaged uh, and offshoots of denominations have been created uh, when people disagreed with others about what was necessary uh, in order to be Christian. <clears throat> so many of the, den the denominations that are popular uh, for us here in the United States, uh, Lutheranism, uh, Methodist, uh, Presbyterian, uh, Episcopalian, uh, Catholic Church, all of these, my brothers and sisters, were created um, uh, around the debates around, about what was essential. Uh, but even uh, uh, there are other uh, groups uh, who have beliefs that are not popular in the United States. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the Western Orthodox Church and the Greek Orthodox Church, um, which was a primary, an early and primary rival to uh, Catholicism, uh, which has its own sets of rules. Or the Ethiopian Coptic Church, which despite uh, uh, popular belief and um, against what most uh, people in the Catholic Church will want to admit the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian Coptic Church is the first and the earliest church uh, created, not the Roman Catholic Church. Before there ever was uh, Roman Catholicism, there was uh, Ethiopian uh, Coptic beliefs, my brothers and sisters, which is why I always make the claim uh, that Christianity uh, was nurtured in, if not born in, the continent of Africa, uh, because Africa holds the longest established Christian church. Um, and so debates about what we believe 
um, have raged throughout centuries. At times, these debates have gotten uh, far out of hand and have cost people their lives. Uh, literally, people have died because they refused to acknowledge someone else's beliefs as essential in order to be part of the Christian faith, uh, my brothers and sisters. And because of this, there are many people uh, who have felt left out of the church, many people who might otherwise find a home uh, in the walls of the sanctuary have felt left out um, because um, they have been judged or ridiculed or looked down upon uh, because they do not measure up uh, to someone's uh, understanding of what is required to be a Christian uh, because they do not necessarily believe what is supposed to be the right thing or because they are not necessarily living in what someone has determined the right way. Um, they have been talked down uh, uh, to or talked down at. They have been uh, uh, called names. They have been isolated, uh, my brothers and sisters, and made to feel unwelcome. And so anytime they see the church, anytime uh, they hear uh, somebody proclaim the good news of Christ, they are already on guard because of the exclusion that they have experienced by those who claim to be Christians, who claim to speak in the name of Christ. But this has not only happened, my brothers and sisters, in Christianity, but also in definitions and understandings of what it means to be black. Uh, that definitions of blackness um, have been debated over uh, over the uh, the years, my brothers and sisters, and we've seen movement uh, uh, and uh, people digging in around certain concepts about what it means to be black. Um, uh, we have seen. Uh, 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 there have been many people um, who have, uh, as they have uh, sought to establish themselves and establish their family and friends in a certain level uh, of success, have created definitions of blackness um, uh, that are around uh, one's proximity or one's ability uh, to navigate uh, uh, the, the dangerous and treacherous landscape of white supremacy. So that if you don't know the, uh, the cultural mores, if you don't dress in a particular way, that somehow it questions your ability to be an authentic member of the black community, or at least a member of the black community that we look to and respect uh, because of the white normative gaze. In other words, if you are not a black person, that white people would look upon um, and, and find acceptance. If you're not a black person that white people would accept, then you're not a black person worth celebrating. Um, many people have, uh, 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 have either stated explicitly or acted as if it's implicitly true, my brothers and sisters. We've created definitions of blackness that have been defined by what we believe white people will want or accept um, in order to make ourselves uh, look more appealing, be able to uh, navigate a little bit of success um, in a white capitalist structure that was never designed for us to be successful except for uh, uh, occasionally and by accident, my brothers and sisters. Um, other people have set up definitions of blackness almost in response to this that completely eschews any notion of proximity to whiteness. Um, and so uh, people have uh, celebrated a definition of blackness uh, that is anti-intellectual or anti-education, uh, uh, that the way that you define blackness is by its resistance of any, of, uh, uh, any uh, knowledge or education or mores that may be considered uh, close to whiteness. And so uh, one of the challenges uh, that Barack Obama vocalized as he was running for the White House um, was running up against this segment of the black community um, who resisted uh, him as being authentically black uh, because of the way he spoke, because of his education. Um, and so the president, uh, uh, throughout his presidency, continuously pushed back 
upon this segment of the black community uh, because of the hurt that he experienced by being rejected uh, by people who he thought were his own, by people who he thought would understand uh, what he was going through, but being rejected because they felt like his experience put him out of touch with who they were and what they were going through. And so these multiple definitions of blackness um, are sometimes in conflict with one another, sometimes are at war with one another, my brothers and sisters. Um, and, it, and it raises the question then, what does it really mean to be black? Um, the reason I bring this up is because I uh, hear in this text, my brothers and sisters, uh, what we are seeing happening is Jesus is walking through uh, a period or a region um, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the world uh, where these questions uh, have multiple implications. Uh, the text says that Jesus is traveling along the border between Galilee and Samaria. And Galilee and Samaria, my brothers and sisters, um, were, were about as uh, culturally as far apart as we imagine Ohio and Kentucky are far apart. Um, that they uh, operated differently, they thought differently, even though uh, they have the same origin, their religious beliefs, my brothers and sisters, uh, 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 pulled them uh, uh, separate from one another in ways that they saw the other as traitorous uh, to what God was really trying to do. Uh, they look at each other as being heretics, as being uh, not really following the law of God. And the differences between the two for anybody outside of them would seem to be minuscule, would seem to be insignificant. Um, it would hardly be recognizable for anybody who did not grow up in one of the two. It was a difference on where you worship. Is Jerusalem the most holy place to worship, the temple in Jerusalem? Or is the mountain that is in the midst of the land uh, known as Samaria uh, the most holy place uh, to worship? Is there really a resurrection of the dead? Do the dead uh, uh, bodily resurrect? Uh, differences that would not seem uh, to create the type of uh, chasm between people who were suffering at the hands of oppressive nations uh, uh, that we see, my brothers and sisters, uh, but these differences were so deeply felt amongst themselves that even in the, even in the face of oppression, uh, that they still kept their distance from one another. It's why Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan is seen as a scandalous parable, my brothers and sisters, uh, because this Samaritan uh, person uh, having mercy upon a Jewish person when other Jewish people did not have mercy on a Jewish person uh, would be seen as being something that was so far out of the realm of people's imagination of what was possible. Certainly if Jewish people did not look upon other Jewish people with kindness and compassion, certainly a Samaritan would not do so. In fact, they were more likely to believe that the Samaritan would kill the Jewish person who was vulnerable there, uh, unable to defend himself, uh, holding on to the last uh, uh, gasp of life, uh, other, rather than heal or help this individual. It was easier for them to believe that they would hurt them rather than heal them, my brothers and sisters. And so Jesus' parable is scandalous uh, because this person who they would have regarded as a cultural and religious enemy uh, does the, the kind, merciful thing to help the Samaritan. Um, and so in this world, my brothers and sisters, uh, there's something interesting that happens uh, that uh, when we come to this place that Jesus is navigating on the border, uh, these rules which seem uh, in some places to be so hard and fast, these definitions which seem to be so important to some people uh, become less important along the border. Uh, that uh, in these borders, my brothers and sisters, because most of the political borders uh, that, that uh, happen, that exist around the world, <coughs> are not, um, uh, most of these political borders uh, are not clearly divisible. Um, they are not places other than uh, signs or markings 
um, that can be recognized um, unless you have some kind of uh, wall or fence uh, that separates the two. And even in that case, still the economy from one side normally directly impacts the economy of the other side. And so there are places along the United States-Mexico border where if there were not a, a, a sign to tell you the difference between the two, you would not recognize that you've crossed over between southern Texas and northern Mexico because the region is much the same. The climate is much the same. The culture is much the same. The economy is very much the same. That everything but in those in uh, northern Mexico and parts of southern Texas are the ex are the exact same, except for political differences about who controls what. And so the same thing is true about this area between southern Galilee and northern Samaria. That uh, uh, this region uh, was so uh, uh, was so connected, my brothers and sisters, uh, that there along the border, as Jesus passes through, he comes to this village and finds these ten lepers who are a mixed group of lepers. We have some Jewish and some Samaritan lepers who are there in community with one another, my brothers and sisters, defying what would have been the cultural norms uh, because they have a common understanding of their condition and being outcast by both of these cultures. By virtue of being lepers, they would not have been welcomed either in the Jewish community or in the Samaritan community. They were outcasts from both communities. And rather than perpetuate uh, uh, this ideological difference between two cultures, uh, they realized that they are better together than they are apart. And so these lepers from separate communities now come together and are engaged in uh, common uh, communal survival, my brothers and sisters. They realize that their survival um, is contingent upon their ability to be able to live with, work with, and support one another in this place. Uh, uh, for those of us who were here on Wednesday, we talked about this on Wednesday as we celebrated uh, uh, what will be the uh, uh, induction of Beloved Community Church into the United Church of Christ. We talked about uh, the dangers of going alone uh, in this struggle and how and why you need to be walking with people um, in this, my brothers and sisters, that God did not design us either as individuals or as churches to try to navigate these systems alone, but we ought to be in a relationship with one another because the work of God, the work that God is calling us to do is bigger than any one of us individually. And that it needs our partnership and our cooperation collectively in order to do what God is calling us to do. Um, and so here, these people who have been kicked out um, of their various homes have figured this out together, my brothers and sisters. And so as they are in this act of survival, they hear that Jesus is walking through the area. And so they come uh, looking for Jesus. And when they see Jesus, uh, they call from afar out, as was their custom, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, have mercy. Uh, uh, by virtue of, uh, of the religious law, my brothers and sisters, because they were leopards, they were not allowed to come in contact with so they would have to cry out from a distance, unclean, unclean, so that anybody who happened to be passing by them know that they were leprous and know uh, that they should not uh, uh, be touched or approached. Um, and so in their calling out, my brothers and sisters, uh, they add to their call a cry for Jesus to have mercy on them. Um, and then Jesus gives them uh, uh, this uh, interesting instruction. Jesus tells them, go show yourself to the priest. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want you to understand um, uh, 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 both the opportunity and the challenge uh, that is in that instruction. Because the reason they are in this leper colony um, most likely is not because they volunteered to be there. Because most people don't volunteer to leave their house, to leave their family, to go live as an outcast uh, in a region of the land that they are unfamiliar with. Uh, but the reason that they are in a leper colony is because they have been assigned to the leper colony. They have been kicked out of their community. They have been excommunicated until the time that they are able to... Uh, to find healing or recover from their leprosy, and the person who kicked them out was the priest. 
It was the priest who kicked them out, the priest who declared them unclean, the priest who declared them unworthy, the priest who banished them uh, from communal life, the priest who said that whatever skin condition they may have had, my brothers and sisters, in the term leprosy, uh, was probably applied to a variety of skin conditions that could have been as simple as a rash or a pimple or as complicated um, as, uh, as more deadly or dangerous diseases. And there's no way to know where along the spectrum these individuals were or how serious their condition, except for that the priest declared on sight them to be unworthy to live with, be around, touch, or interact with anyone else except for those who were themselves considered unclean. And so uh, by the word of the priest, they were excommunicated. And now Jesus is telling them to go to the same place, to the same people who excommunicated them in order for them to be made uh, whole. Uh, now there is opportunity in that, my brothers and sisters, because the truth is uh, that they would have been in violation of the law had they returned home without going to the priest, that they would have been in violation of this religious law and would not have been seen as being right to reach into the community. The priest was the gatekeeper, the one who had to officially declare them uh, whole. Uh, the challenge of this, my brothers and sisters, is that Jesus is sending them to the priest without any evidence apparent that they have been made whole. In other words, my brothers and sisters, it isn't like the leper that Jesus touches and, uh, and by uh, the touch uh, uh, that he has been made whole. It's not like the blind uh, person um, who Jesus spits on the ground and creates mud and puts the mud over their eyes and tells them to go wash. And once they have completed the act of washing, they are made whole. It's not like uh, the lame individual who is lying there uh, by the pool of Bethesda waiting for the angel to stir the water who Jesus reaches down and picks him up. And as Jesus picks him up, his legs and ankles receive strength. There is no um, activity there is no action. Jesus does not do anything, perform any sign, do any action to show that a miracle has taken place. He just tells them to go and they walk, my brothers and sisters, without the miracle having yet happened. Uh, I, I say that to say, my brothers and sisters, there are some times in our walk with God, there are some times in this Christian walk um, that we have to begin to take action without knowing what the end is going to look like. Uh, every, uh, uh, every problem that we have, my brothers and sisters, the answer is not apparent to us before we move. Sometimes we have to move in the direction before we see what God is doing. Uh, this is what faith is, my brothers and sisters. Faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith, my brothers and sisters, does not require that we know the answer. In fact, if we know the answer, then it isn't faith that we are operating in, my brothers and sisters. Faith just means we trust that once we move, that God is going to move ahead of us or around us or through us or some kind of way. God is going to make sure that things work out. It's why there is a promise that uh, God gives Paul in the book of Romans uh, that reminds us that all things work together for those who love the Lord, for those who are called according to God's purpose. Uh, what Paul doesn't say is that everything feels good or seems good or looks good, my brothers and sisters, but Paul says that God works all things out for our good. Uh, which means, my brothers and sisters, that sometimes we just have to get up and walk in a general direction and trust that God will meet us along the way. Uh, 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 just in case you don't believe me, can I call a couple witnesses uh, to help us testify about this? God called Abraham, and God said to Abraham, I need you to come and leave your father's house and go to a land that I will show you. God does not give Abraham a GPS. He does not give Abraham map quest directions. He doesn't even give Abraham an old Rand McNally paper map. Abraham does not know where he is supposed to go, nor does he know the way to get there. But God says, leave where you are and start walking. And once you start walking, I will show you where you are supposed to go. Uh, brothers and sisters, when 
God caused Moses uh, to deliver uh, uh, the Israelites out of oppression in Egypt, God gives Moses a crazy half-baked plan to get the Israelites out. God does not tell Moses how it is going to work. God only gives Moses his instructions for what he's supposed to do. Moses, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh that the people need a vacation. Uh, and Moses, I can hear Moses uh, saying, if not out loud to God in his mind, God, the people don't need a vacation. They need liberation. They need to be set free. We don't need to figure out a way to be accommodated to the oppression in Egypt. We need a way to get out of it. But God tells Moses, this is your job to go get the people a vacation because God knew that once the people got out of the land of Egypt, God had a plan so that they would never have to go back. But Moses didn't see the entire plan. Moses just had to do his job. But brothers and sisters, sometimes God calls us to do things, um, and the whole plan is not revealed to us. The whole plan uh, doesn't seem to be in place. We look around, and it seems like we don't have everything we need at this moment to do what God is calling us to do, my brothers and sisters. And that can seem paralyzing. It can seem daunting. It can seem frightful or fearful, my brothers and sisters. But I want to encourage you to have the faith of these ten lepers who have approached Jesus, my brothers brothers and sisters who Jesus commands to go and before they knew they were healed they went on their way to the priest because they took Jesus at his word that by the time they got to the priest that their healing would be in place my brothers and sisters and I want to encourage somebody out there you don't have to have it all figured out you don't have to know the answer to everything all you have to do is take the first step and trust that God will meet you along the way won't you help me preach this? Won't you turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, take that first step and God will meet you on the way. I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that we serve a God who specializes in meeting people along the way. Uh, I asked uh, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was along his way uh, to Damascus to persecute the Christians when God met him on the way. Ask Jonah who tried to run from God and God met Jonah along his way trying to run. We serve a God who specializes in meeting people on the way, my brothers and sisters. And so I encourage you, if you want to see God show up, if you want to see God do something special, if you want to see God do something miraculous in your life, get up and start moving in a direction and see if God doesn't show up on the way. Uh, we serve a God who specializes in meeting us on the way. Uh, as they are going, my brothers and sisters, uh, uh, the Bible says that uh, there is something interesting that happens. Along their way, they realize then that they are uh, that they have been healed. The, the leprosy, the physical manifestations of the leprosy have faded away. Um, there is nothing on their body to indicate uh, any scars, any remnant of the maladies um, that they have been experiencing. They look completely healed, my brothers and sisters. And the Bible says uh, uh, that nine of them continue on their journey, but one of them turns back and comes back to give thanks. Uh, now, many people in preaching this um, have uh, uh, um, have indicated that this is uh, some super spiritual insight on behalf of the one individual or some deficiency in the spirituality of the other nine. Mm -hmm. uh, they said that it is this one person who has inside of him already an attitude of gratitude. That this person, there's something about his relationship with God before this moment uh, that, that puts him in a position to recognize what has happened and to go back and give thanks. Um, and that the other nine were somehow spiritually deficient. And I understand, my brothers and sisters, why people would preach that. I understand why people would say that. It sounds good. It makes us feel good because we all want to be the one person that comes back. And none of us want to be the nine that goes on and is not thinking. And, my brothers and sisters, no matter how we act in our normal lives outside of the church, 
the fact that when that sermon is preached, we jump up and down and say, thank you, God, for what you do for me in that moment makes us feel like we are like that one leper, that one Samaritan that comes back and worships. And, it, and we really don't take into account if we show that same gratitude in our daily lives. In that moment, because we say thank you, we feel like that we have the right uh, spiritual attitude, my brothers and sisters. And so when we hear the sermon, it seems to validate our worship in that moment, and we feel like we have it going on. Because nobody wants to be confessional and say, no, I'm actually one of the nine. I'm not one of the ones that would go back and say thank you. Um, if nobody told me to say thank you, I wouldn't do it. In fact, I would have kept going. Uh, uh, we don't want to admit, my brothers and sisters, there's a reason that only one out of the ten goes. is because that is, uh, it's not the easiest thing to do. But, my brothers and sisters, I want to argue that the point of this text is not about the individual spiritual strength of the one leper or the individual spiritual feelings of the nine. I, I want to argue, my brothers and sisters, uh, uh, that as I have been trying to articulate um, for the uh, uh, for over the past year, specifically, uh, that the ministry in uh, message of Jesus is often more subversive than we have come to understand. Um, that um, that the uh, American um, uh, idolatrous mix of white supremacy. Um, in Christianity, my brothers and sisters, has robbed us of being able to understand the Bible. Uh, and sometimes it's been in very intentional ways, as we talked about what happened as people tried, as people uh, in, uh, uh, intentionally misinterpreted the Bible around scriptures of uh, uh, Noah and of Cain uh, to make blackness seem like a disease in the Bible in ways that the Bible was never intended uh, uh, to try to speak to my brothers and sisters. Um, uh, but in other ways, it is the unintentional misreading of the text because the only way that white supremacy uh, matches with Christianity is if you take a surface reading of the text. And so on the surface, this seems to be about having the right attitude. It seems to be a text that's aligned with Brene Brown's uh, message that if you just can be grateful that everything in your life will be so much better. It seems to be a personal, uh, a personal message about your individual disposition or your individual spirituality, my brothers and sisters. But I want to argue that the message in the text is so much broader. That uh, when Luke says uh, in this text, um, uh, at the end of verse 16, that he came back praising God uh, with a loud voice, uh, he prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. I want you to note this, my brothers and sisters. Uh, we said at the beginning um, uh, of the sermon that one of the differences between the Jews and the Samaritans was about where was the cultural center of their worship. Because of that, also uh, a difference was where they would have to go in order to be welcomed back into the community. The Jews would have to go back to Jerusalem. Uh, uh, this passage is taking place at north of Samaria, south of Galilee, a little bit south of where Jesus uh, grew up in Nazareth, um, uh, many miles north of Jerusalem. Um, and so if you can imagine in your mind's eye, um, uh, Galilee, uh, Samaria, and then uh, Judah or Judea, where Jerusalem was. And so this is taking place between Samaria and Galilee to the north, meaning that they would have to travel through the lake of Samaria, either on foot or if they had access to a boat on the lake around Samaria to come down to enter into Judea, to go to Jerusalem, to speak to the priest in Jerusalem in order to be certified to be able to go back home to wherever they lived. It was only the priest in the temple at Jerusalem that could certify them as being now made clean, my brothers and sisters. And so all of them are walking back seemingly to the temple in Jerusalem, except for one of them stops 
my brothers and sisters. Um, and the reason that one of them stops, I believe, is that even though in their community, my brothers and sisters, they may have forgotten who they were, or they may have forgotten what was most important to them in their lives before becoming lepers, uh, that once they are made whole, one of them stops and remembers, hey, wait a minute, I don't need to go to Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is not where I go to check in to make sure everything is all right. And so I believe it is his cultural difference that stops him in his tracks. In other words, my brothers and sisters, the culture that he grew up in or that he was a part of by virtue of being a Samaritan already conditioned him to resistance against a Jewish norm that would have operated to the north of him in Galilee and to the south of him in Judea. He was already used to resisting the influences of what was around him, even though everybody started walking back to Jerusalem, he stopped because he was already accustomed to resistance. In that stopping, my brothers and sisters, he did not fall into the false dichotomy of saying, instead of going to Jerusalem to get my certification, let me go to the mountain to get my certification. But he realized, my brothers and sisters, that all he needed to be made whole had already happened, and so he did not need to go check in with anybody in order for his healing to be complete. His healing was already complete. Upon that realization, then he goes back to the person that healed him and stops for a moment to say thank you. It is in that thank you, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus gives a profound word and he says that where all the others who have, who were made, who were healed, uh, because you have come back, your faith has made you whole. Now, my brothers and sisters, uh, some have taken that to believe that there was some element of healing that had not completely taken place for the others, that while they may have been healed on the surface, that there was something else uh, that needed to happen that Jesus affects when he says this to the man. But I want to argue it's not Jesus that creates the wholeness for the man, but it's his understanding. Uh, walk with me just a little bit more, my brothers and sisters. Uh, this man had been caught in a tug of war between two religious systems that tried to tell him where God speaks, where God moves, and who has the right uh, uh, to, na to navigate uh, the power of God amongst the people, either Jerusalem or in this mountain. You remember the conversation that Jesus has with the woman at the well uh, when Jesus asked her uh, to give him a drink. Uh, they get into a conversation, uh, um, and then the woman says, Jesus, I see you are a prophet. Let me ask you this religious question. You Jews believe that Jerusalem is the place to worship. We Samaritans believe it's on the mountain, which is correct. Uh, they were, uh, the Jews and the Samaritans were caught in this A-B conflict, our brothers and sisters. Do we worship in Jerusalem or do we worship in the mountain? Where is the place where God's presence is most made manifest? Jesus says the day is coming and now is when it doesn't matter where you worship. It's not about going to Jerusalem or in the mountain, but what matters is how you worship because those who come to worship God will worship God in spirit and in truth. That it doesn't matter where you worship because as Jesus proclaimed throughout the Gospels, the spirit of the Lord is everywhere. <laughs> Especially where people are the most broken, especially where people are the most downtrodden, especially where there is the most need. Those are the places where Jesus went and said, the spirit of the Lord is among you. The presence of the Lord is here. Not in the sanctuary, my brothers and sisters, not in the temple, but out where the needs were. This man was made whole because in that moment of healing, he realized that he did not need to check in with the priest at the temple. He did not need to check in with the priest at the mountain. He did not need to check in with everybody that all that he needed, he already had, and he was free to go home. And on his way home, he just stopped by Jesus to say, thank you. I say that, my brothers and sisters, to say that as a church, we have to think about who is it that we want to be in the text. Mm. Mm. 
Because so many churches take the position of either the priest in Jerusalem or the priest in Samaria on the mountain. That people have to come to us. They have to check in with us. They have to check off the list of things that we say are appropriate. That people have to jump through whatever hoops we believe that we have been made to jump through. So there must be something holy and righteous about those hoops. They have to do what we have had to do in order to have access to God. And if you do not do that, if you are not willing to say you have done that, if there's no evidence or manifestation that you have done that, if nobody writes a letter saying that you have done that, if there's nothing that indicates that you have walked through the hoops, that you know the proper etiquette, that you can recite the 23rd Psalm or the Lord's Prayer, or know at least three of the five verses of Amazing Grace, if it doesn't seem like you walked through the right doors, then we want to say you don't have access to God. Or at least not yet. Because you don't uh, worship God in the way that we recognize it. And so we too often occupy the place of the church in Jerusalem or the church in Samaria and say you have to check through us in order uh, to have access to God. Uh, but, my brothers and sisters, uh, I believe, as in all things in the Gospels, the church is called not to be like uh, the, the priest in Jerusalem or the priest in Samaria, but we are called to be like Jesus. Mm. That we are called, my brothers and sisters, not to create checklists for people. We are called, my brothers and sisters, not to create a uh, work for people to do in order to access the Spirit of God, but we are called to bring the presence of God to people, to help them realize, my brothers and sisters, that God is already at work with them and around them and through them. That you don't have to come to church to find God, that God is already with you. That the reason we come here, my brothers and sisters, isn't because we believe that God is located only in this place, but we come here because we believe that God went out and reached out in the highways, in the byways, that God went to the high mountain tops, into the low valleys, that God went around each nook and cranny and back alleys and office suites, and God found us wherever we were hiding, and God loved us enough to bring us together in this place, my brothers and sisters, and so because God God came and found us and loved us. How dare we sit here and act as if we have done something to earn God's love? Our brothers and sisters, I want to suggest that we ought to make a practice of throwing away the checklist, throwing away, uh, uh, throwing away uh, the things that uh, we have been told uh, uh, required are required for God to love us. Because God's love is freely available to us. And once we throw away the rules, I believe, my brothers and sisters, it is that space, it is that space of freedom that this man experiences when he realizes he doesn't have to check in that gives him the opportunity to be thankful. Once he is no longer burdened by having to make the trip all the way down to Jerusalem, to the temple, or all the way to the mountain at Samaria for someone else to approve of his healing, now he is able to pay attention to what has happened and what God is doing in his life, and he is able then to be thankful for it. My brothers and sisters, I want to say that gratitude, gratefulness, Praise and worship is not something we can impose upon people. Mm. It is not something that we can yell at people to do or force them to do or shame them into doing, my brothers and sisters. But it happens spontaneously, that it happens, it erupts inside of people's spirit when they have the space to see what God is doing in their lives. Mm. And if we ought to be doing anything as a church, if we ought to be doing anything as a body of Christ, we ought to be creating a space where people can see what God is doing in their lives. Where people can see who God has created them to be. 
where people can remember what God has put inside of them, where people can get in touch with the genius that God has created inside of them, my brothers and sisters. The church ought to be a space, not that sets rules and regulations or hoops for people to jump through, but a space that clears all of that away so that people in this space can have access, can hear God speaking to them. It is why we take this moment right here to say, God, what is it that you were saying to me? Because my brothers and sisters, the truth is you don't need me to tell you what God is saying to you. My job as pastor is not to tell you what God is doing in your life. My job is simply to lift up the word as I see it and then for you as you hear it to ask the question, God, what is it that you were saying to me? What is it that you are doing in my life? God, are there rules in my life that I have let get in the way of my relationship with you? Have I been so attentive 